Enrique Barsalo, 102771, born in Manhattan, New York. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? High school. All right. Um, you obviously volunteered for the Army. Um, why did you decide to go in the Army? Why did you decide to volunteer? Uh, I think I was intrigued, like a lot of kids, watching movies, old, you know, John Wayne movies and things like that. Sparked an interest, and I think what really caught my attention at the end was uh, when they were prepping to deploy for to Panama, the 82nd, uh, which they actually had interviewed on TV, I believe, one of the channels and was broadcasting. And uh, the Maroon Beret just kind of caught my attention and said, hey, that's that looks like a good place to go. Um, got out of high school, enlisted, went to a 25th ID for a while, about three years, and went to the 82nd. Did you go to uh, jump school right after basic training or, uh, or no, EIT? When I uh, enlisted, they put me as an 11 Bravo. Um, didn't really know much of anything else of the service. Um, I was really quite ignorant to anything the service had to offer other than the Army. Um, so I didn't know about the special units they had, you know, the Ranger Battalions, the uh, 82nd Airborne, or mm -hmm. as a, I just wanted to be in the service. Um, so I did my first tour in 25th ID in Hawaii uh, for about three and a half years. By that time I started to understand uh, different units, what they were about, better understanding of, of the whole picture. Re-enlisted to go to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Had jump school in route with PCS, and uh, from there I went to 82nd from about 94 to 98. Then I got out and joined the guard. How many jumps did you make? Um, <coughs> I think we, on record, probably like. 60, mm -hmm. 60 jumps. Uh, there was a low period where uh, I think funding was becoming an issue. Uh, and the Army works funny that way because when I first came into the service, it seemed like we were doing a lot more training, a lot more time out in the field, you know, six, seven months out in the field. As uh, I don't want to blame it on the president or any political party, but I think throughout my years, there was a low where the cutbacks of the service, the funding for the service, so our training was less and less every year. Um, same thing happened once I got to North Carolina. Uh, we jumped quite frequently, and then as time went on, we started jumping less and less. Uh, enough to make our, our jump status and our pay, but not as frequent as when I first initially went there. So. Um, Got out 98, uh, immediately joined the Guard. I knew I wanted to stay connected to the service. Uh, so in 98, you went right into the Guard then? or Yeah, I had been in? almost five years at 82nd, and the only actual way I think you could have gotten out was um, going to Korea. That was one choice you had, but you would return back to North Carolina to brag. Mm -hmm. um, what rank were you at that point? I was an E5, E5. Um, they weren't allowing any soldiers to go beyond uh, Korea and back to 82nd. So if you wanted to go to another um, another post, they weren't doing it. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I made the choice. You know, I need a change, change of pace. Join the guard. Um, as E5 left the 82nd. Uh, Went to Delta Company, first of the 105th, which was in Troy. Um, that's where I met uh, Sergeant First Class Ross. Now, how did you end up up here? My wife. Oh, okay. My wife is from Saratoga County. So we chose either between my family in Florida or her family in Saratoga. Was she in the military too? No. No, she was. So we decided to come up here. Delta Company, 105th, uh, 
it was an 11 hotel unit. It was the only one that the New York had for my MOS. So that's the one I, I chose. Um, I didn't feel like changing my MOS. I was there from pretty much 98 to September 11th, uh, 2001, when everything started to change. Uh, obviously, we went down to the city uh, in support of the airport missions and anything else they had requested from us to do. Um, power plants to include the tour. So you basically were at JFK and then uh, you were at um, Albany Airport also? Albany uh, Airport, Indian Point, Power Indian Plant Point, down, okay. Peak Skill, um, and Fish Kill, I believe. All the way up until the time they requested for uh, volunteers for the deployment to Iraq, uh, NOIF 2. So there was a little, I won't say confusion, but it was uh, pretty difficult the way they did the selection process for soldiers that wanted to go. They selected, uh, they requested one platoon from our company, volunteers first. Uh, they acquired their, their full platoon, um, then they would take the excess and tell them, hey, they're not going. And then the larger unit that was going afterwards, uh, they selected individuals that did not get selected the first time around to go with other units. So, so Ross, myself, and one other NCO got placed in Charlie Company, second one way. So we went from Delta Company uh, to not deploying to Charlie Company, second one away in the line, which is uh, typically it's infantry too, just different MOSs. One's an anti-tank, and then the other is an 11 Bravo up front. So we had to uh, change our tactics a little uh, and get savvy on the 11 Bravo side. Yeah, it's been quite a while since any of us have done any of the uh, grunt work on ground. So it was a little bit of a shock, uh, good wake up call, good learning experience. Um, deployed. Do you think in retrospect after doing your training that you were prepared? Um, you know, it's funny because when we returned from BNOC, we did an interview with Fox News. This was just before the deployments happened and they were asking us the same type of questions, you know. They were looking at the guard units because they were deploying and asking us, you know, do you think you're ready? Do you think mm -hmm. you're trained? And, uh, you know, I put it out there. I believe that, yes, you know, um, it's not so much the training, but the initiative and the leadership that you had on how much they wanted to train the standards. Because um, if you can't implement the training, obviously you're not going to learn mm -hmm. or your soldiers. So uh, I think the leadership was put together well good group of individuals. Obviously, like every unit or every company, they have their bumps and bruises they gotta go through in order to get to that, that high. Um, was it an extensive six months prior to deployment? Yes. Uh, did I agree with it at the time? Um, I think I did. I think six months did as well. Uh, maybe not all the training, but at least at a minimum, being with the same group of guys for six months to build the team, uh, whether they believe it or not. Um, you know, I, I believe it helped because everyone was coming from different parts of the state. So you're talking about different types of personalities, backgrounds, no different than active duty, but at least in active duty, you, you stay with a, a platoon or a unit for a while. Then you PCS, you go to a new one, but you're talking almost a full two and a half of new individuals coming into a unit to deploy with others that they've never worked with. Um, different leadership styles, talking from E7 all the way down, so it was quite a change. Um, but I think it was worth it. Uh, did I ever have a squad for a long enough period? Probably not. I think I changed. In that six month period, I had one, two, three, 
probably four different squads, four different uh, individuals. Um, so to be consistent with training, to try to get to know the soldiers is a little difficult if you're changing squads all the time, which seemed to be an issue. They couldn't get the right combination for some reason of people where they wanted them. Um, and it continued throughout the deployment and then even during the deployment we changed the company's or organization. So we had quite a few changes um, until we got it right. Um, we left October of 2004 is when we actually started the MOVE. I believe we got the country in March or April of 05. No, it couldn't have been April. Uh, March, March of 05. The typical active duty um, feelings for the guard, you can kind of see when you got there. Uh, I was on active duty and I knew what I thought of the guard at the time, and you can see it. Uh, you pretty much just had to prove your capabilities, you know, as a, as a force uh, before they would accept you, you know, and allow you to do what you needed to do without micromanaging or without scrutinizing what you do. Um, a little disappointing as far as uh, what the Joes outlook was for active duty. Um, for those who were on active duty prior to going in the guard, uh, you would always preach, you know, active duty standards are this, this is how we conduct business. And then when you get there, it's a little different. Obviously, it's not as stringent as you probably remembered it when you left, because every generation it seems like it was harder for them than it was for the new generation. You know, World War II vets, it was definitely harder for them. If you ask them, they did a lot of things that were just a little out there. Vietnam vets, same thing. Um, so as the generations go on, it just seems like it seems easier for some reason. Um, so when I left, the service was a certain way. You know, six years later, the discipline and everything else, they were a little disappointed. Um, but the unit that they linked us up with, the 126, uh, very good unit, very disciplined, a lot of great NCOs and leaders that they had there. They had some changes also during the period we were there. Um, the first month in country, very quiet. Uh, you know, the right seat, left seat ride wasn't there, so there was the information flow wasn't enough of it to explain to us what was going on within that city, what to expect. Uh, so the first month, I would say, very calm, um, nothing going on, uh, peaceful, really. I mean, it just seemed like we were walking in the park like we were training, you know. We didn't see much of anything. Uh, I think after the first month, you had one or two uh, specific uh, situations like the April 11th ambush, um, they kind of woke everybody up. Um, sometimes they always say good things come out of bad, bad mm -hmm. situations, and I think that was it for us. Uh, you know, you want to talk about the April 11th uh, in a little more detail? Yeah, um, I think during that time they allowed the city of Samara through political channels, seven days of their holiday, which uh, meant for us we weren't allowed in the city for those seven days. No military forces allowed within the city limits. Uh, so we did the next best thing. and We reconned and we uh, patrolled outside the city, outside the skirts. Found a large cache of uh, ammunition uh, within the five days that we were out there. Um, set up an ambush site there. We were up for a good 24 hours um, before we got called back in to go back to the FOB. Uh, the planning and organization wasn't 
done exactly the way it should have been. Uh, all leaders make mistakes. We ended up moving out with half the company. Uh, our mission in route was to recon and go through a sector of the city uh, prior to coming back into Brassfield Moor, going back to a uh, home station. Uh, as we were entering the city, First couple vehicles made it through. They waited for the five ton. Five ton got hit right by uh, the mosque. Um, we were right behind them in the other five ton. The selection for that, for what vehicles you're going in, seemed kind of ir ironic because before we actually moved out, we were all looking at each other trying to figure out what vehicles we wanted to go in. So. You know, the platoon sergeant, Sergeant Mack, and the other soldiers, you know, we were sitting there going, you know, hey, you want to go on this five ton? Uh, don't, well, that's got the sides on it. You know, how many can you fit? You know, well, you take this, and you know what? We'll just hop on this one. You guys got that vehicle, you know, and just back and forth, you know, conversation, trying to get everything organized, not really thinking much about it, just trying to get guys on the vehicle. Um, Was everyone kind of exhausted at that point because you're up for 24 hours? Yeah, at that point, I mean, you know, last mission we'd been out for five or seven days. We had done uh, tactical checkpoints, you know, in, in that heat for days. It just, it was, yeah, by that time we were pretty exhausted. Mm -hmm. um, so we tried to do the best we can, trying to organize the vehicles, trying to get everything on, uh, you know, I can recall looking at the LT, asking him for more time to organize things, him telling me that the commander needed to, uh, you know, to move out uh, in accordance with what the battalion commander wanted at the time. Uh, really not much information given. So as we moved out, you know, everybody did the right thing, did what they had to. Really. You know, we asked for a situation report, enemy situation report. After seven days, we assumed that, you know, something's got to come down the pipe. Uh, the answer we received from, I guess, battalion, uh, I don't know, was uh, enemy situation was zero to 5,000 at the time. That was our enemy situation for the sector. So this is in route. You know, I had taken the second five ton with no protection whatsoever. My guys were sitting in the back. I was TCing, driver, gunner. Um, they were sitting on rucksacks. Uh, they didn't even have the typical five ton sides they normally do to keep everything in. It was just open. The vehicle in front of me, which, which was a five ton with the quarter inch steel plates that were welded, um, had about a squad full of soldiers in it. Platoon Sergeant, um, squad leader, uh, the RTO, and some other individuals, Nate Brown. Um, so as we're moving along, coming to the city, uh, I can honestly say that that was probably one of the best executed ambushes, whether it be American forces or enemy, that I've seen executed. Um, whether it be Hollywood style or not, mm -hmm. it was by far, by the book, tactically sound. Everything was checked off when we entered that building by the enemy. Surprise, directions, execution, initiation, everything. Um, they initiated the ambush with an IED to the five ton on the right side, I believe. Uh, Two RPGs from the mosque in front of us to our right, one o'clock. Uh, by that time, the five ton was to their 12. Uh, and then water rounds to our left, uh, linear across the road. And then obviously small arms fire. All at once. So uh, they had seven days to prepare for it. They executed it well. Uh, Luckily, they didn't receive, I'm sure, as many casualties as they would have liked to see uh, for that type of ambush. Um, 
all I saw was a dust cloud. Couldn't believe it. You know, looking at it, couldn't even see the truck. Just one big puff of black smoke. Thought they were done. Um, so much firing that I told my driver, we we had done known the area, uh, so we knew certain parts that we could drive down. I told my driver to cut a hard right into that street, and by that time, I told my guys to dismount. Um, they dismounted. Uh, they probably dismounted before I even said the word. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, obviously, I couldn't see, but uh, they were on the ground doing what they needed to do. Um, on ground, got out, guys out, you know, uh, laying down to press fire security, trying to find out where everybody is, uh, trying to get comms with hire. There was no communication. Um, just kept on calling out the direction of enemy fire, which was basically 12, 1, 6, 3, 9. Uh, hoping that someone wears, you know. Uh, truck was in the middle of the road, kind of hidden, but not hidden behind the mosque. Um, trying to communicate with another squad, company commander, whoever was on the horn. I didn't care at that time. Just someone give me some feedback. Uh, we're letting you know where we're at and what it's looking like here. Uh, didn't hear any response. I uh, spread my guys out on both sides of the road. Uh, tried to get a good 360 security. Uh, tried to get the uh, five ton pushed out in a safe location um, because the RPGs did come from the mosque. Uh, luckily we had, we did have the truck push up as close to the mosque as possible, which uh, did not allow the two individuals up top to fire the RPGs because of the way it was obscured. Um, so that took care of the truck, the driver gunner, um, they kept their security. Couldn't really leave the position. We had the five ton. I wasn't going to leave the vehicle. We wasn't going to leave the two guys. We had equipment on the five ton. The wounded were on the five ton too? or were We they had no wounded. Unlike the first truck, we had no wounded. Mm -hmm. Uh, to this day, we try to figure out how, with something that was so open and uncovered as our vehicle was, uh, I think they just laid everything into that one five-ton right in front of us that was no more than, you know, from me to that wall. Uh, you know, they took their opportunity, they knew their target of operation, uh, their target of opportunity, um, and that was one of the five tons. They didn't hit the gun trucks, you know, they hit two five tons or the five ton in front of me. Um, laid out, you know, got the squad out, total of like eight personnel. Um, tried the best to, to get security out, lay suppress the fire down the roads. Uh, you know, fire just seemed to be raining from everywhere. You know, uh, you got guys yelling at you, asking you what they want you to do. You know, giving you their suggestions, and then you got other half telling you, you know, asking you what you want them to do. You know, what are, what are we doing? What are we doing? Um, it seemed like Saber Pirate Ryan. If anybody's ever watched the movie, you know, the beginning opening picture where everything slows down. Mm -hmm. It's really not, but it is. In your brain, everything's slowing down, and you're taking it all in, but I'm sure to other people, everything's just moving at its natural course. And uh, I guess your, your brain just kind of slows down to take it in and analyze to make a decision. What may seem like a second to someone else in your brain may seem like a few minutes. So that's what I felt like, you know, everything just slow down, you take a good picture of everything that's going on, um, and then you just come out with whatever decision your brain decides to make at the time. Um, Mine was, you know, cover any avenues that we can, hunker down, 360 around the vehicle. We weren't going to leave the vehicle. Uh, it was very difficult to take any of the buildings because that's where most of the fire was coming from. Uh, saw a couple of uh, Iraqis trotting down the road with RPGs, going from building to building. Guys opened up, you know, um, finally got a hold of one of the trunk uh, truck 
gun trucks at the end of the convoy that did not leave with the rest of the convoy. So basically as we stopped, the vehicle that was probably 100 meters was taking on a lot of fire also, and they stopped to engage. Um, and then the rest of the convoy pushed out with the wounded to the uh, safe house for the uh, special forces. I think at that point, it was rare that, that, uh, that they were ever being counterattacked on an ambush. Usually you hit them, you know, people suppress through the gunships, but no one actually gets out and tries to uh, counterattack the ambush site, which I think threw them off at that time. Um, just for that area. I'm not saying it's never been done before or mm -hmm. other units didn't do it, but I think at that time, that moment for our unit in that uh, area of operation, it just wasn't happening. So, broke contact. Uh, you can see them trying to break contact. Coming down from their rooftops, coming down, going in the street with their RPGs, trying to get a better position so that they can create more casualties on our side. They run around RPGs. Uh, AK-47s, the uh, roadside in which they had linear targets for the mortar rounds was an open field, and it was a lot of open field with a lot of hills, small bumps, almost like uh, just uh, man-made uh, fighting positions all over. Uh, so there was quite a few rounds coming from that direction. Uh, finally got a hold of someone, which was a truck the last uh, gun truck tried to pinpoint his location. He tried to pinpoint my location. Um, found out that we were within 100 meters. As my guys were set, uh, returning fire, doing what they had to, I pulled away, went down a little bit, tried to find and identify the vehicle um, so that we can link back up, consolidate, reorganize. Uh, and they were actually just, it worked out really quite well. They were actually cutting off the individuals we were pushing out down the road without even knowing, without even communicating. They were cutting off one side of the street and we were pushing them out of the other side. Um, still kind of hard with the communication factor because of uh, the radios we had. Um, as far as equipment, New York gave us all the gadgets, brand new, out of the box. We probably mirrored the SF units, other than maybe radios that we did order and just never got to us in time. So communication was definitely an issue at that time, um, but at least there was some type of contact between the two uh, elements left uh, in the kill zone. Um, I think at that time, another vehicle came back up, which was the commander, uh, Captain Rodriguez, with uh, a Mark 19, um, comes up from the direction the convoy had left and passes us because we're on foot, five tons on the side, kind of hard to see. Sees, identifies the vehicle, sees, goes to the vehicle, consolidates with the vehicle. Um, I gave them our location, they moved up to our location, we consolidated, um, tried to reorganize a little bit, uh, make a final plan to get out, how we're getting out, where we're going. Um, only problem is that the vehicles, the gun trucks had spent, expended so much rounds, they were black on ammo. The Mark 19 and 50 cal. Uh, I think they, 50 cal or 240, I believe they had a 240 at the time. Um, so as far as ammo to get back to where we needed to go, we were pretty limited. Um, target of opportunity, yeah, we were still it was still there for the uh, Iraqis, the insurgents. Commander said to get back on the truck, the five ton. Uh, I didn't really agree with it after what just happened, so I just let him know that uh, I think a better plan would be to just walk out. So we just took street from street, fired, covered, allowed the vehicles to push up, push the next team up, because at that time we only had a squad, which is about nine, but I think we were down to eight. Um, 
I think for one, two, it could have been for maybe five, five blocks of covering and firing for the vehicle to push out. Uh, I tried to communicate with the tankers to come down and give us some support at the location. They couldn't find us for some reason. Uh, Pop Smoke still couldn't find us, so we had to go to them. Um, made it down to the location, finally got on the five ton. Uh, went back to the safe house, the uh, SF safe house, uh, where we dismounted. At that point, we did a good consolidation and reorganization of uh, equipment, personnel, water, ammo. Um, first thing we wanted to do is go find out how our, uh, our buddies were doing. Uh, got the burden of bad news. Watched the truck filled with blood, just getting washed. You can smell fresh meat on that truck. You know, it was just, uh, it was bad. You know, uh, guys at that time, I think. For the younger soldiers that didn't care about much, and this is why I say good things sometimes come out of bad, this was their turning point. At this time, they saw exactly what could happen if you didn't do the right thing and listen. If you wanted to be an individual, you didn't want to be a team player, um, this was the outcome. So I think this was a turning point for the company, for the younger soldiers and some of the older ones, um, to uh, change a little, you know, to take it seriously. We had a month of nothing. And I think we believed, some of us believed that that was what it was going to be like for nine months, ten months. So the turning stone was, hey, someone died, <coughs> got some guys injured, going back, this is what it's like, this is what it's going to be like. So, got to change your attitude. Um, I think we all definitely saw a difference in the attention span of individuals that you wouldn't have seen before, which was great. Um, because now you knew they were paying attention and you didn't have to worry about that aspect. Uh, life comes into perspective real quick uh, with things, when things like that happen. Do you think if um, you went in with a larger force, this wouldn't have happened or wouldn't have been as severe? Larger force? No, I honestly think that seven days of prepping they would have still took their opportunity to hit. Mm -hmm. um, they're not, they weren't there to fight. They're there to disrupt. You know, that's why they nitpick. That's, that's why they select certain targets. That's why they, you know, hit you with an RPG and then move out. They don't stay to fight. You know, they try mm -hmm. to disrupt, discredit the U.S. for being there. You know, um, I don't think it's, you know, I was never in Vietnam, but I can only imagine trying to fight people you really can't even see. You know, the slicky boys are just integrated into everyday population and they pop up here and it's it's frustrating. You know, so they do their job, you know. Um, larger force, I think the only time things calm down is when they see that you cap down on it. When uh, things like that happen after that for a long period, uh, the force was more aggressive. We spent longer in the city, um, so that changed, you know, the outcome of, of obviously their uh, direction. Uh, they change just as quick as we do, you know. In fact, I think we change because of what they do. Um, they are proactive. They are very intelligent. Um, you know, uh, larger force. I think they still wait. They had seven days. You know, I don't think there was anything our chain of command could have changed as politics. Um, eventually, I think a larger force did help, mm -hmm. but it took a lot, uh, quite a bit. It took 25th, some of the CAV, the uh, first ID, to include us. I mean, you're talking three, four units to cap down mm -hmm. uh, on a city of 250,000. So eventually, I think that would have helped, but at the time of having that many days, I think they were just going to try their luck.
especially since being that we're only in country 30 days. Even if we went in company size, it's a new patch. Mm -hmm. They have no idea what our capabilities are. Did you ever find out uh, how many casualties the enemy took? Um, I believe the record showed that it was like 65, um, and that was just during our time, our 20 minutes, mm -hmm. and then I think it was somewhere up to maybe 98 once, you know, everyone came in and, and did their thing. Um, so this ambush was only about a 20 minute duration? Mm -hmm. Initially, the initially, yeah, the ambush it probably was less, you know, maybe twenty minutes. During that time, it's kind of hard to even mm -hmm. keep track of time. Yeah. So that was a pretty good size opposing force. That ambush. force, absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, I'd never seen whether it be Hollywood style or, or, you know, been something mm -hmm. that well executed. You know, even in training, you know, it was just. All right, they got that one. That's that's fine. I mean, it happens. Um, now you mentioned you is, papers have been submitted for Bronze Star to the V for Valor. Yes. Is that for this action? Uh, that and another action. Um, you know, when you're doing things, you really don't think about them until you see it on writing that someone else wrote, mm -hmm. and you kind of just look at it like, okay, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, because you can't really see yourself mm -hmm. doing things. Yeah. So, documents have been in for like two, three years. What's become them? I don't know. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think there was, I mean, there's other events, but I think the uh, most rememberable events that changed that company for that duration, that deployment was that. Mm -hmm. um, everything else was just what we were supposed to do at the time. Now, Brokaw had a special about that. Were you in it, that at all? Was No, that was the individuals that were hurt on that flight. Yeah, so right. I, yeah. I, I didn't know if he included others. Um, they had asked, but, uh, you know, it's really, uh, that story had to do with soldiers mm -hmm. that he interviewed, mm -hmm. you know, the injured soldiers and mm -hmm. how they adapted before, during, and after. Now, now, were they civilians at that point? Were they... They now, some the of them were on med hold. Okay. Some were going through the medical process mm -hmm. um, to be cleared from the service. Um, so they were still soldiers at the time. Uh, I think one might have been out, depending on what his, his uh, injury was. Uh, the platoon sergeant, Sergeant Abrams, he was interviewed. Um, but other than that, most of them were, you know, that one group. Uh, great guys. Uh, you know, I've been on active duty, and I would definitely compare the company that I went with at the time. I would put them up against a lot of the components that I've been with. Mm -hmm. um, professional, great leaders. Um, it's like uh, sports teams, you know, at certain times, mm -hmm. they just have the team that clicks well and makes everything happen. Like the Yankees, you know, they won like three in a row, three World Series. And eventually it's got to change. I think for us, that time was then where everything just worked well, you know, people meshed together, they did what they have to, great combination of uh, leadership and personalities to make things happen. Because uh, there was a variety of other events that happened throughout the time we were there, and realistically, if you look at the numbers, our platoon, second platoon, sent home 12 individuals. That's a lot of people for one platoon. I think, I believe we went in with 32 or 33 individuals. Did we take the brunt? Absolutely. But overall, if you look at some of the other companies or other locations or past wars, we did well, mm -hmm. losing only one. Or actually two with your vine that was attached to us during the uh, attack, uh, taking the city back over. And that was another unfortunate, uh, one of those things that happened that you just can't explain. You know, you've seen people shot a thousand one times and survive. And, uh, during this operation, Baton Rouge, on the rooftop, uh, 
takes a piece of shrapnel into the chest side of the plate, couldn't find the entrance, bounce around inside his, his vest, and uh, there's nothing you can do, you know. Uh, and then, yeah, you turn around, you see people getting shot all the time, and they survive. You know, things that are just, you look at it and you're like, oh, this guy will never live. So, um, I think that w those are the two biggest events, and again, only because you have casualties like that that make you um, always remember, that leaves an impression, an imprint in your mind, uh, specific things like that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I don't remember, I mean, I remember a lot, but the only thing I could ever remember out of that specifically in detail would be when he was shot or when he was injured and then over the radio, you know, uh, they're requesting for a medic medevac or a medical uh, assistant and uh, BLT telling them, hey, we'll be there in three minutes. You got the uh, special force, you know, medic coming down and the guy on the other line just said he doesn't have three minutes. So you either get him now or he's done. Mm -hmm. After that, you know, I, he'll be there in three mics. He doesn't have three mics. And radio went silent. And that was it. And then everybody was just concerned about who it was, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, so those are, you know, definitely I think you remember things like that more than you do any other actions that you do uh, throughout the time that you're there. When did you return home from the wreck? December 31st. Or yeah, December 31st. I think it was around New Year's, January. We were back by January. Um, were yeah. you assigned to the uh, the uh, border at all? I was assigned to the border through the Inspector General's office. When I got back, uh, returned, <coughs> found myself being selected to go to the IG's office uh, as an assistant IG. Uh, went to the, uh, the Inspector General's office, went to school. Um, and during that time when they were deploying uh, troops to the border, they signed me and the, um, an inspector general to do inspections on, you know, the mm -hmm. facilities in which they were going to, just to ensure that everything was going right to support the soldiers down in Arizona. Um, so that was the only way I was involved, was mm -hmm. pretty much just tagging along to uh, see if any issues that may have not been handled so that the next batch that goes through doesn't have the same problems or if it's even worth going to. Mm -hmm. Okay, could you tell us about each one of these photographs then? Yep. That's uh, Lieutenant Zoll and Sergeant Moore. Lieutenant Zoll, by far, has been one of the best lieutenants uh, I've ever worked with. Uh, anyone who knows him, I can tell you the same thing. He's a, a s older lieutenant, but tactically sound. He uh, listens, and in uniform, it's very difficult to uh, to try to replace a lieutenant like that. Um, Sergeant Moore is one of the squad leaders. Uh, he started as, I believe, a team leader um, in the platoon. I came to the platoon when I was talking about earlier, the reorganization throughout the company, even in country, part of it was changing the, the squads in the platoon. So I became their four squad, and I believe throughout the time, um, his squad leader uh, was injured, and they made him a squad leader. And a very smart, uh, good person, mm -hmm. you know. Now, who's that other individual in the photo? Oh, that's oh, that, me. Oh, that's you. Okay, let me zero in on that. Okay. And I believe we were, in this picture, going to do a convoy with about uh, 95 uh, oil tankers from Turkey, border, all the way down to Anaconda. So, that was us waiting for the, the tankers. Uh, 
Uh, this picture is of me and Sergeant Moore on a rooftop. Uh, I believe at the time we're doing the overwatch of uh, one of the roads near the, the, uh, the patrol base. Uh, I can't remember who took the picture. Uh, it, caught us, it did actually catch us by surprise. That's why we're both looking back because uh, we're the only two supposed to be on that rooftop. Oh, what kind of gun is uh, Sergeant Moore? Is that M21? I believe they had him back in now. It's a sniper's Wait. rifle. Yep. So, what was Sergeant Moore's first name? Sergeant Moore's first name was oh, I can't remember. Okay. How about uh, your lieutenant's first name, so? No, I don't know their first names. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this picture, this picture was taken during the last patrol in Samara. Um, this was the very last walk we took, and we returned, and then decided to do a group picture. Uh, this was almost what was left of our platoon after the year was done. Uh, I believe there were some individuals that were at the, one of the uh, patrol bases. Uh, there weren't many. I think this was what was truly left of uh, the platoon. Now, where are you in that photograph? Bottom right. Okay, now is uh, Sergeant Ross in there? Sergeant Ross was in a different platoon. Oh, okay. Um, like I said, there was a lot of reorganization mm -hmm. done within the company, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, did we see each other? Yes, we did. Uh, was it pre frequent? Not really. Um, by the last three months, last three or four months, they uh, put our platoon in uh, Bob Giovanni, which was named after obviously the soldier that died in Baton Rouge, uh, and we spent the last couple months in the city. I'm trying to clean it up, and uh, the patrol base was center of the city, uh, very accessible to the enemy. Uh, we get mortared constantly, um, so much that after a while it was almost like an everyday thing. You know, you know, you're getting shelled. Okay, we back in, come back out. Um, I think we received. A lot of, uh, I mean, even to the last three months, we were sending people home, you know, which was kind of difficult because you're so close, you know, at this point, you know, three, two, one month prior to leaving, you don't, you don't want to see anymore. Mm -hmm. So we took a lot of hits during the last three months at, uh, at the patrol base you're buying. A lot more foot patrols, uh, a lot more, I wouldn't say action, but a lot more activity, obviously because you had us in the center of the city. So, um, and we were less people than what we actually started with, so it made it even more stringent on the platoon to uh, accomplish a lot of the tasks, a lot of the missions. You know, you're talking almost 12 guys at the end of 10 months continue doing what a normal platoon does all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they pulled us out. Obviously that picture is the last patrol. We did our right seat, left seat ride. Um, tried to explain to the individuals, soldiers coming in, their leadership, what to expect, how to be, what to do, how to walk. Um, which was something that wasn't done for us. We probably would have been a little bit better prepared, but I mean, um, they can take the information. However, uh, I think it's like every new unit; they want to test the waters at first, and then they'll set back to uh, what the original people tried to explain to them at first. Mm -hmm. I mean, it always happens that way, you know. New faces, new leaders. This is what we're doing it, and then they realize that hey, the people who left actually are telling us something that we need to know. So, uh, you know, 
I would see Sergeant Ross periodically coming through. Um, he worked on the trucks. He was the uh, in the platoon with the truck company that we had developed within the company, and uh, you know, just went through quite a bit in the city. A lot of patrols. Um, a lot more mortar attacks, a lot more shooting, a lot more defensive. Um, I think the stress level went up, which is kind of odd for it being towards the end of your tour. Mm -hmm. Normally stress levels in the very beginning, you know, you'll have some high points and then low points. But uh, I think for us it was, it was higher than it was prior to. I think we were more comfortable with everything. Um, we knew the people, we knew what to expect, we knew what to look for. Um, but I think the stress levels, as far as looking at what we've seen last year, the V beds, the IEDs, um, and I'll give you a, a, an actual situation. We were doing a patrol. Um, we had approximately, you know, they give us good periods of time to do patrols in the sector. <laughs> Walking down, doing a patrol, garbage everywhere, if you ever seen pictures of Iraq. Um, one of the things they always tell you to do is look for anything that's odd or out of the ordinary. It's kind of difficult with, you know, locations like that. Everything looks odd, and it's, you know, out of place. Uh, there was a mount, wire sticking up, just a black wire. No one thought anything of it. Uh, Sergeant Kleins actually picked it up and pulled it out and at the end of it was a timer, and it was actually still going. So he yelled at IED, and it just creates like a bunch of chickens with no heads. Everybody just runs for the hills, dispersed like someone just dropped the A-bomb. Um, we all fan out, move out, just run, you know, grab our squads as fast and as far as we can go. Call EOD, EOD comes, sends out the uh, robot, digs it up, uh, and he finds his first one, 105 shell, continues to dig, and I believe he found like six um, linked together, Davy chained together, six or eight, Davy chained together. Uh, I believe the only thing he said that stopped the timer was the uh, tape, the electrical tape around the actual timer, which actually stopped it from going off, or the remote didn't accept the information coming through because of the way they had it set. Um, when I asked him, you know, if this thing went off, what would be the rate of our casualties for our platoon at this time? He's like, well, let's just put it this way. The only thing that would have survived this would be the truck that's way down there, about three to 400 meters. So at that time, even the non-smokers had a cigarette break. You know, because we came real close. Uh, not that we didn't before, but this was a larger scale. I mean, you know, to, to find out that three quarters, one truck would have survived this. You know, we were already down, you know, eight, nine people. I don't think we would have took a loss like that. That would have just been the end of, you know, the morale period. Um, so, you know, the stress level, obviously, every time you took a step out, knowing that you just go back to the center of the city, uh, elevated. Every time you walked out the wire, you know, squad leaders were point men. Um, by far, I think the most stressful job is a leader. It doesn't have to be a squad leader, just a leader. Someone who's responsible for soldiers, and their lives based on their decisions. Um, you know, every time we walked the street, it was the same thing. It was just on edge, making sure that where you walked, where you brought this platoon into, was a safe place. Um, so, you know, things like that stick out in your mind. Um, events, I should say, and it's human nature. The only way people change is when events happen, dramatic events that leave an impact. Everything in between, it's vague after a while. You know, I mean, you talk to older veterans, they'll give you specific events. 
everything in between, good or bad, it's kind of vague, you know? And those events that stick out are usually the ones that change that person in some mm -hmm. way. Um, so for us, it was many, you know? Uh, other than that one incident, you know, being in the, in the middle of the city, on edge all the time, for the last three months, knowing that we were leaving soon, or we might stay a little longer because the 126 requested for us to stay for an additional three. You know, um, was it good learning experience? Absolutely. Would I change it for anything other than the casualties? I would never want to change it um, because I believe that those events, situations, um, decisions is what makes you a veteran, a combat veteran. You know, you can bring something back and hopefully help future soldiers. And without it, there's really not much you can, I mean, you can read out of a book so much, but without the experience, you know, you have nothing really. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of events. Sergeant Ross always comes up with events that uh, he talks about when we talk to other people. He, he tells me about the situations or events, and I always ask him, like, what war were you in? Was I there? Because I, I don't remember. You know, and he's like, don't you remember? And I, I, I do. I mean, I, I remember quite a few, you know, uh, taking up blocking positions, trying to find a, a... Tanks are hard to lose. They're big objects. Mm -hmm. They tell us these tanks are going to be at the four corners of this large area on the street. Okay, it's pretty simple. Meet up with your tank, full security, and... Uh, let the operation go through what they need to. You're securing an area, 360. Sounds like an easy task. Find out that your driver gets you lost. You're in a 113, and if you've ever been in a 113, you can't see out of it if you're in the back. Only the driver and the mm -hmm. TC. Drop the ramp. You're good. Get out, and it's not even close to where you should be. Try to link up with some individuals, see some friendly 126s, what company you, you know, what platoon. At the minimum, I know that this platoon is working in this area, this area of operation. All right, I got it. You're supposed to link up with snipers. Can't see them right now. Linked up with them. No tank to be found. That was my target. That was my guide. Call it back up. They give you the message. Well, you're going to have to take that area by yourself with your, I think we had. Uh, a little shy of the squad at the time, and then two snipers. So to go from a tank and some troops to just some troops was a, a little stressful. Um, eventually we linked, we kind of hollered at a tank as it was driving by and snatched it up and just said, this is where you belong. Uh, you can help us out by sitting here and looking through your thermals. And uh, so it worked out, uh, but a lot proceeded throughout that night. Just trying to get into the city, RPGs, small arms. They wanted, you know, they wanted those tanks. That was their big prize. Tanks, 113s, anything with a track. And uh, seemed like the Fourth of July. You know, uh, they were dropping grenades off rooftops. Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of little stories in between there. Um, like anything, you know, I'll probably remember them down the line. I'll tell one or two here and there, but if anybody ever asks me, I just tell them I'm a cook. <laughs> you know, I was a cook, at NCO, and the, and the chow hall, and I used to hear the stories from guys coming in, and that's how I know so much. And, uh, I, you know, Ross, great guy. He, uh, he remembers a lot more than I do, so I just always confirm with him. Were we in the same one? Because I don't remember that. He's like, yeah, and then I remember. So I guess it's uh, selective what you want to remember, not wrong. Yeah. Want to remember. Okay, well, thank you very much for the interview. All right.